Well, gentlemen, we might make a start. So first and foremost, thank you very much for everyone for joining us today. We've got plenty to get through. I'm hugely delighted to have both Will and Terry on this webinar with us today. Uh, we've got a lot to cover when it comes to all things Aussies in the US, tax, finance, property. There's a lot to cover. We're going to get stuck straight in. If you have questions as we go through, pop them in the chat box. If they're short and sweet, we'll get to them as we go through the webinar. If they're a bit more detailed, we might hold on to them until the end. Uh, and if they're extremely detailed and personal, we'll take that offline. But feel free to pop it in the chat. Uh, anything you're not sure of, anything that doesn't make sense, let us know. We are recording this, so it will be up on YouTube as well. Uh, so if there's anything you don't quite catch or didn't quite sink in, you'll have the opportunity to watch it again. Uh, but on that note, let's dive straight in. Now, of course, it wouldn't be a finance webinar without our disclaimer. So everything that we cover, both myself, Will and Terry, is very much for your own education and hopefully entertainment purposes, but it is not personal advice. So anything that you need uh, to seek advice on personally, obviously reach out to Terry or Will or myself, and we can have that discussion offline. So look, as I said, plenty to cover. Uh, so very briefly at the beginning, both Will and Terry will give you a bit of an introduction of who they are. By way of introduction myself, my name's Jared Brown, I'm a financial planner here in Singapore, and I'll let Will and Terry tell you a bit more about themselves. So we'll cover off those introductions at the start. Then we're going to get into the most exciting topic first, the Australian and US tax system. What do you need to know? How do the two work together? Which will naturally then flow into tax residency and employment. We're going to then spend a bit of time discussing Australian property and what you need to know, particularly if you're living in the US, moving to the US, uh, or even thinking of leaving the US and heading back to Australia. We're then going to touch a bit around both superannuation and investing in general, and what we need to be mindful of as a resident of the US, as a taxpayer in the US, a bit around current opportunities in the market, where we're sort of seeing markets heading, and putting it all together. What do you need to know? What are the key takeaways? So as I said, plenty to get through. Uh, so hopefully you get a ton of value out of what we cover today. Uh, but again, thanks for joining us and we'll dive straight in. So, Will, I'll throw over to yourself to uh, tell us a bit about you and Ally Wealth. Thanks, Jared. So, uh, hi, everyone. My name is Will. I'm Senior Financial Advisor here at Ally Wealth Management. So, we specialize in expats or well, Aussie expats living all over the world primarily. So, we have clients in about 35, 36 countries, I think, at the moment, but the US being one of our primary uh, client bases. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of Aussies living in the US and the complexities of the finance system there. <laughs> and, you know, having them from Australia and US and the, the relation between the two are, are quite interesting. So people need that help and they come to us to, you know, help manage their finances, their superannuation, their investments, everything like that. Um, but yeah, definitely keen for the webinar today. We've got a pretty global webinar. I'm in Perth at the moment, Jared in Singapore, Terry, I believe you're in Sydney. We've got some people registered from, you know, the West Coast of the USA, the East Coast of the USA, from the middle. So quite a global webinar today. It should be, should be really, really good. Excellent. Thank you, Will. And on to our, our process, I suppose, to go into a little bit more detail as well. The way that we work with financial, uh, with our clients when they proceed with financial advice and want to get that next step, the first three sessions, are, or the first three steps, I should say, are no cost, no obligation um, engagement that we have with people to get a little bit you know, more information about them, what they're trying to do. So first and foremost, we say, right, what are you actually trying to achieve and can we help? Secondly, let's go into a bit more you know, details. What are all the pieces to the puzzle? Thirdly, we have that strategy session where we go into an in-depth analysis of your situation. You know, if you did A, what would happen? If you did B, what would happen? You know, this is what you need to start thinking about based on your age and your goals. Then obviously anyone who wants to proceed to that next step, we go into the advice stage where we give them the strategic plan uh, and then obviously the ongoing support to continue to maintain that as well. Fantastic. And Terry, tell us a bit about yourself and Pitch Partners. Yeah, hi guys. Um, my name is Terry Hoban, um, and it's great to be here. Uh, so big thanks to Jared and Will for the invite. Um, I'm an executive director at uh, Pitcher Partners. Um, Pitcher Partners is um, sort of a mid-tier accounting firm based in Australia, but we are part of the Baker Tilly network internationally. Uh, so I work within the uh, the private business and family advisory division of Pitchers, and we specialize in helping individuals and their families who have cross-border tax issues. And my particular focus is on that Australia-US corridor. So we do a lot of work for Australians heading to the US, 
um, or repatriating from the US, uh, as well as a lot of work for US citizens and green card holders living in Australia. Um, there's a lot of very unique tax issues that come up for people who have connections to Australia and the US, um, and we're dual qualified. So I'm a US CPA and always have a lot of experience with Australian tax. Um, and so we try to provide that holistic service where we're helping clients with both the Australian tax side of things, as well as the US tax side of things in Australia. Um, so we do a lot of uh, US tax advice, Australian tax advice, US tax returns, Australian tax returns, um, and Pitches is a full service firm. So to the extent the clients have um, other accounting and tax needs, like if they have trust structures, companies, businesses in Australia, um, you know, we, we can we can service all of that as well through the firm. So, um, yeah, it's great to be here and uh, look forward to, to talking uh, all things tax and finance. Fantastic. Well, look, let's dive straight in. Uh, so we'll start off. Uh, Will, I'll throw over to yourself to kick yeah. us off. Well, I think it's a good a good preface for today's webinar that there's a lot of common issues, you know, when it comes to Australians living in the US, how do they deal with their finances? What can you do with your superannuation? What visa are you on? How long do you plan on, you know, living over there? When do you plan on coming back? What do you do with the home? There's so many questions and there's so many common issues that come up when people, you know, want to move to the US or they're repatriating back to Australia or they're even just considering, you know, the option. Um, so one of the the um, themes that you'll get through the conversation today is you need to seek help and you need to seek help as soon as possible. <laughs> Usually the sooner you do it, the better. So whether it's reaching out to Terry or myself or, or anyone for that matter, that the sooner that you understand what options are available to and what are the what are going to be the challenges in front of you, the easier it's going to be for you to make that move and um, you know accelerate your wealth as well while you're going through that move. So going through a few of the common issues, just grab the next slide for me, Jared. So there are the, the six main ones that we see with people moving to the US that sometimes aren't considered or, or, or the primary thing they are considering your property. So most Australians, the majority of their wealth is in their main residence property. Um, people have no idea what to do with it. Do they sell it? Do they keep it? What happens if they sell it when they're over there? It gets quite complex. Superannuation and pensions, another big one that we see. So um, the US obviously have 401ks, IRAs. They're very different to our superannuation system here in Australia. So making sure that you understand the differences and what you can do is usually a big step as well. Uh, PFIC rules, we'll go through those a, lot, a bit later. They are uh, not fun at all from the IRS. Uh, and then you've got issues too, like remote working. You know, what am I doing with my US state taxes? So the US tax system is very different to Australia. And then as Terry just touched on as well, any other structures like trusts or companies, things like that, they always add in that little bit of extra complexity. But these are the main issues that we see people, you know, being faced with when they're moving uh, overseas and moving to the US or, or repatriating. And it's the key thing. So moving on to the tax residency side of things, Terry, I might throw over to you. Did you want to explain a little bit about how the tax residency works between Australia, between the US? Yeah, sure. So um, tax residency is really the the starting point or the, the building block for any sort of tax advice that we'd be giving to people when they're relocating. Um, and it's uh, the case is that basically you have, you know, you've got two jurisdictions you're dealing with. So you've got a strict, the Australian jurisdiction and you've got the Australian tax residency rules and you've got the United States and you've got the US tax residency rules. You've also got state tax residency, depending upon the state in the US. So, for example, if you're heading to California, California has its own unique tax residency rules. Um, some states don't have any income tax uh, like Florida, Nevada which is great, um, but a lot of the more popular states like California and New York, unfortunately, do. Um, so considering that as well is important. And then you can sort of end up in this situation, um, you know, particularly if it's, a, if it's a shorter duration of time that you're looking at being in the US, you can end up in a situation where both Australia is saying, hey, you're still a resident of Australia under our rules. The US is saying, no way, you're a resident of the US under our rules. And then you have to turn to the tax treaty, which basically has a tiebreaker test to see which country wins. Um, so understanding those tests is important as well. Um, on, the, uh, on the Australian side um, for tax residency, uh, we'll maybe if you just go to the, the next slide. Um, so on the Australian side for, for tax residency, this is usually where it's a little bit more complicated because the Australian tax residency rules are um, based on 
legislation from 1936. <laughs> so um, it's very old rules and it's, it's rules that's been built up over a long period of time based on a lot of different court cases. Um, so, and they're very subjective. So um, you need to do like a really deep analysis sometimes of all the facts and circumstances. So we ask clients a lot of um, questions, sometimes very personal questions um, to sort of work out what their Australian tax residency position is and when that's going to change. Um, and in terms of sort of a, a general framework, whilst we won't sort of get into too much about the specifics because it can get quite technical, um, there's basically sort of four main uh, you know, limbs to the Australian tax residency test. And if you trigger one of the limbs, you're basically a tax resident. Um, so, you know, the first test is called the resides test um, mm. and basically looks at a, a range of different factors to see whether you are effectively living in Australia or living outside of Australia. The second test basically is the domicile test, which says that if you're born and raised in Australia, there's certain things you need to do to establish that you're a non-resident of Australia. Um, and that's really around um, what sort of accommodation, what sort of ties do you have to the foreign location? Um, and there's you know, a plethora of uh, court cases um, going into intricate detail about, you know, um, if you rent uh, an apartment um, in this apartment block and then move from this apartment to this apartment, is that is that going to meet this test or not? And um, you have to be really in the weeds with some of this stuff. Um, mm. The 183 day test, probably not that relevant because that's really more about people coming into Australia. And the super test, um, it does you know, pretty rarely come up in practice these days, but if you do have a particular type of older um, you know, Commonwealth superannuation fund um, and you're still an active employee, then you'll still be a tax resident. Um, so working through this and understanding like what's your Australian tax residency um, is, is basically the starting point. Um, if you do end up um, uh, sort of becoming a US tax resident and breaking Australian tax residency, um, you know, the next thing that you're sort of naturally probably thinking about is, um, you know, when you're, when you're working in the US, what's your, what's your tax position going to look like? And um, in terms of the general uh, employment income taxation in the US, um, you know, you will usually typically most of our clients will be on US payroll. And when you're on US payroll working in the US, they're going to be taking out the different types of taxes. So typically they take out the, the federal tax. Um, if you're working in a state that has state tax, they take out the state tax. Um, and they'd also take out something called FICA, which is basically the US Medicare and US Social Security taxes, which, which can be a, a fair bit as well. Mm. Um, and so, you know, if all things are going well, they're, they're taking out the taxes and then um, you know, you file the tax return at the end of the year, you get what's called a, a W-2, which is like their equivalent of a POIG summary, um, mm -hmm. and you file your tax return um, before 15 April. Um, we do see issues come up where people are still on Australian payroll, um, but they are working in the US and incurring uh, a US tax liability. Um, one of the biggest myths is, uh, you know, if, if I'm on a payroll being paid from X country, then I'm only taxable in X country. Uh, mm -hmm. Whereas the, the reality is it's really based on where you're physically working. So the tax rules generally, generally don't care about where you're payrolled. They care about where you're physically working. So if you're on Australian payroll, but you're physically working in the US, your sort of starting point is you're probably going to be taxable in the US on that income. Um, and then you have to go through this process of getting the money to the IRS and to the US tax authorities through paying with a tax return or through estimated tax payments, and then a process of getting that money back from the ATO. And that that uh, process can be quite painful. So getting the payroll right and shifting payroll at the time you actually you know shift countries um, definitely helps in the longer run. Um, and then you know, there's also issues with uh, employee share schemes, but we'll, we'll get to that a, a bit later in a bit more detail. Yeah, I think a lot of people don't realize that, like, you know, people see Australia and the US is quite similar in a lot of ways, like our cultures can be quite similar sometimes and whatnot, but people don't realize how different our tax system is. So in Australia, I think it's quite simple in a sense, you've got your income tax, everyone has the same, 2% uh, Medicare on top, whereas uh, as you touched on in the States, 
You know, you can file as individual, you can file as a couple, you've got, you know, your federal taxes, your local taxes, your state taxes, figure there's so many different levels and so many different things to it and different components. And I think that's a big shock for a lot of people when they move over is they go, wait, so I'll get taxed differently if I live in Texas compared to California. And say, so, yes, it's something you need to consider. You know, it's something that's going to impact, you know, your move. And obviously at the end of the day, you know, the more money you have, you know, in your pocket and not paying tax to the government, the, the better, the more you can do. So we want to be minimizing that wherever possible. Hmm. Perfect. Now, moving on to property. Um, so as I've touched on before, property is um, really in Australia, most people's majority of their wealth is in their property uh, and superannuation as well. So when it comes to property, though, a lot of Australians, we use property for investments as well. So whether it be buying an investment property or use your, your home that then, you know, later you pull equity out of or you downsize, Property is a great way to grow your wealth, especially in Australia, but there's an added level, level of complexity when you move to the US or you become a US tax resident that needs to be considered. So I'll let Terry cover off the tax side of things, but in terms of the investing side of things and how we can use property to grow our wealth, just because there can be extra tax um, you know, steps that we need to take or, or bills that we have to pay doesn't mean that we still discount it. We don't use it. It can be a great strategy to grow your wealth over the long term, but it always is that long term approach. So example on the screen here uh, is let's say you've got 200 grand in the bank. If you went and put that into the Australian share market and get the average return of about 9.8%, you'd be looking at about 20 grand after a year. So after five years of investing at that same rate of return, you'd have about $125,000 more. Alternatively, with property, because of the benefit of leverage, so where you go take your 200 grand to the bank, they lend you $800,000 and you go and buy a million dollar property, even if the return is lower than what we get in the share market, which generally it is. So average historical return for property in Australia, about 6.3%. We can see that after five years, you'd expect that property to be worth about 1.369 million. So you're making an extra $240,000 because you're, you're buying a much larger asset. But obviously, the big risk with that is you've gone and taken on an $800,000 mortgage. So you need to make sure that you've managed your risk, you can repay your debt. But in saying that, that extra 200 grand over five years, that compounds massively as time continues to go on. So property should not be discounted. But if you are living in the US or planning on moving to the US, uh, or even you know, you're in the US, you're thinking about selling your property, coming back to Australia, there's a few more tax steps that you need to be considering and need to be making sure that you are aligning and making sure that it is the right move. Um, Jared, if you want to move to the next slide, I think it's the taxation side of property. Terry, did you want to cover off the main things people would need to know with property, whether it's their, you know, obviously their main home, how that compares in the US compared to the Australian uh, market? And then two, whether, you know, if it's an investment property, what happens there? Yeah, definitely. And um, yeah, as, as Will said, like for a lot of Australians, property is their, is their largest asset. And so you want to make sure you're doing the planning up front to protect that mm -hmm. asset and protect any potential additional taxes on that asset because they can be quite substantial substantial um, and often it's not something um, that will arise in the the shorter term while you're in the US but there could be implications you know down the track when you sell that property five ten years later because you are outside of Australia for a period um, that you need to be aware of and planning for now um, so the the big one um, that we sort of always talk to clients about before they um, leave for the US before they break Australian tax residency is the Australian main residence exemption. So um, if you were to sell your main residence um, as a non-resident of Australia while you're outside of Australia, you're not going to get any capital gains tax exemption. And that can be quite a large tax bill to front. Um, so generally the advice we give our clients is um, one of probably three things. One is, you know, if you, if you want to sell your house, sell it before you go. Um, mm. If you don't, you know, keep it <laughs> until you get back. Um, and, you know, if there is, um, if you do want to sell and you do really want to sell while you're overseas or in the US, are there steps that you can take to actually stay as an Australian tax resident? Um, mm. And whilst no one, you know, usually wants to be an Australian tax resident and continue to pay 47% tax, um, you do still get the benefit of that main residence exemption. So whether there's planning around the residency part um, that you can undertake is important. There's also um, what's called the, the six year rule. The six year rule basically says that, um, you know, you can be temporarily absent from your main residence for up to a period of six years and still maintain that capital gains tax exemption in full. 
And so um, that's why also it's important to think about, you know, if you go to the US for a period um, and come back and that's less than six years, um, then that's all good. If you go to the US and, and you end up being there for a period of longer than six years, um, even even if you do come back and eventually sell, there's going to be some capital gains tax that arises on your main residence. And there's different rules and different methods of calculating that. Um, and sometimes it, because of that, it's important to get a valuation of your mm. property done when you, when you leave, if you think that's going to be um, a possibility. On the US side, um, it, it's, it's a whole different ballgame. So that you got, you got to sort of remember with the U S So we're looking at everything through a U.S. centric lens. So the first thing is with the, the main residence exemption. Yes. The U S has a main residence exemption, but it's capped. Um, and it's capped at $250,000 of gain per person. Um, and then when you often, as you do as a married couple, you would file a joint tax return that 250 is effectively doubled. So you get $500,000, of exclusion, um, you know, as as a couple for um, the sale of a main residence, and that's assuming that you've lived and um, owned the property for at least two of the last five years. Um, so, you know, you can you can sort of imagine in situations, particularly in the Sydney market, where five hundred thousand dollars U.S. capital gain is is not going to cover the capital gain on your main residence. Um, so, understanding that there is that limit is important, and then the other sort of big issue that um, I see a lot of clients um, come up against is the FX. So again, because everything is through a US dollar lens, we need to consider like, what did you pay for the property in US dollar equivalent back in the day versus what are you selling the property for in US dollar equivalent now? And sometimes that can, um, you know, uh, exaggerate or um, under exaggerate the gain um, that would otherwise arise. And that FX issue um, that also applies to the repayment of Australian dollar denominated loans. So if you have a, a mortgage over an Australian property, when you sell that property, there's actually, and this is kind of um, a bit of a sleeper, but there's basically a rule in the US that says, you know, if you have a foreign loan and, um, you know, you've borrowed um, when the US dollar was weak and then you're paying back when the US dollar is strong, you're actually paying back less US dollars than you borrowed. So you've made money. So you've made a foreign exchange gain. And, you know, with the US dollar at, um, you know, historically high rates compared to the Australian dollar at the moment, this is the bigger issue from an FX um, standpoint that comes up for a lot of our clients because, you know, you might have borrowed when the US dollar was at, you know, 80, 75, you know, and if you're paying back now when it's, when it's in the 60s, you know, even like a five, ten percent foreign exchange differential on a you know one million dollar, two million dollar loan, you know that can be a lot of foreign exchange gain that you need to report as income on your mm. U.S. tax return. Um, you know, for not much benefit. So just understanding what that is as well is really important before you pull the trigger and um, sell property. And then the two other issues that um often come up you know it, we love negative gearing in australia um in the us you can basically you can't negative gear um you know there are there is negative gearing available if you're on sort of lower income levels but once you get over about 150,000 us of um you know salary or income negative gearing just doesn't exist and the loss is sort of deferred and then um the other issue as well on the australian side um, and particularly for investment properties is um, when you eventually sell an investment property, you need to look back through the time that you've held that property. And if any of those uh, years during that holding period have been spent outside of Australia as a non-resident, you'll lose part of that 50% CGT mm -hmm. concession. Um, so look, it's not an issue if you're overseas for say two years or three years and you hold the property for 20 years. Um, but you know, if you're overseas for say, five or six years and you, you hold the property for say 10 years, then you're going to lose a lot of that CGT mm. discount. Um, so understanding that as well. And that's the one that can have sort of a longer term impact because it may not, you know, be a, be a realization event until you sell the property, you know, once you get back to Australia later.
Mm. Yeah. And I think a lot of people too don't realize that you've got, you know, if you're if you're selling a property while you're in the US, you're paying non-resident tax rates in Australia as well, which are higher than standard tax rates. So there's no tax-free threshold from the first dollar with these new tax changes that have come in, you're paying 30%. So sometimes people come to us and, you know, I've been in the US for five years. I've got a home in Sydney, you know, that I want to sell. And, you know, it's worth 1.8 mil, it's, you know, done well over the last 10 years. I want to get rid of it. And you go, okay, well, you know, you're potentially up for a, $400,000 tax bill or something, um, people don't realize the extremes of it. So it can be, yeah, you need to get help, get advice well before you're considering, you know, selling because as, as Terry's touched on, there's a lot of things to consider when it comes to property. Um, but as I touched on, it's still a great investment. So we don't want to scare you away from it. And we still want to be investing in property and using property to grow our wealth, but you just want to make sure that you're considering all the options as well. I think. Um, so on to the investing side of things. Yeah, um, well, just before we uh, jump on, just one quick question has come through from Trish here. So thank you for the question, Trish, on property. So just while we're here, mm -hmm. under the scenario uh, you just ran through, buying shares versus buying property, what could the tax bill be if it's bought as a resident and then sold as a non-resident? Mm -hmm. I think as Terry's just outlined, that is an incredibly, or can be an incredibly complex answer and really depends on the timing. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, how long were you a non-resident? How long were you a resident? What was the total growth over that time? What was the purchase price? What deductions do you have? Um, so probably a, a difficult one to answer in a, you know, 30 seconds or less, mm -hmm. um, but definitely just being mindful of those timeframes and therefore what the tax would be. And as Will's just touched on, uh, just being aware of the fact that non-resident rates could apply as well. So mm -hmm. hopefully that helps, Trish, but feel free to um, pop in another question if, you'd like to go in any more detail, but otherwise we'll, we'll push forward onto the investment side and uh, tell us what we need to know here. Yeah. So look, we wanted to do just a bit of investing one one as well too, because a lot of people when they move to the States, you know, they won't, you know, know what to invest in, or they might, you know, be moving for, you know, a higher income and have some surplus income left over and they're not sure what to do. And property is obviously a large purchase. You know, you might have an extra thousand dollars a month and you're unsure about what to do. So we wanted to do a little bit of, uh, you know, investing one one as well too, because again, these little things that you do, you know, consistently, they compound massively. So when it comes to investing, there's really, when it comes to buying assets, I should say, there's two sides of the coin. There's defensive assets and growth assets. So defensive assets are great for the short term, but terrible for the long term. So if we think of money in the bank, cash, you know, you've got 10 grand in the bank right now, you check it tomorrow, there's still 10 grand there. Low risk, low return. The downside though, you check that in 20 years time, there's still only 10 grand there. It doesn't do anything. It doesn't really grow. It doesn't keep up with inflation. So really good for the short term because it's not volatile, but terrible for the long term because it doesn't grow. So when it comes to assets that grow, we want to be looking at primarily shares and property as the main two. But these are terrible for the short term because they can be very volatile. Like we've just seen this past week, um, you know, I think the ASX was down 6 or 7% at one stage. Um, this week, markets around the world went down. Pandemic was a great example. Markets dropped down almost 40% in just a few months. So markets will always recover and bounce back, but we need to make sure that when we're investing and we're putting our money into these, you know, longer term strategies, it's exactly for that, a longer term. You know, we're looking at 10 years, 15 years. I think if you go to the next slide, Jared, you'll be able to see the different levels of risk that we have when it comes to investing. So any investment will have risk associated with it, but time will effectively de-risk everything. So you can see in the table at the top, equities, over about a 10-year period, the chance of a negative return is only 2%. Whereas in any one-year period, it's about 25% that you could have a loss. Image down the bottom right, that shows us the Australian share market over the last 100 odd years. So as long as you're buying good, well-diversified assets, the general trend will always be up, but in the short term, we'll have these periods of volatility. So again, depending on your situation, depending on what you're doing, um, you need to really be considering what's my timeline, what's my time frame, and then how can I make my money work much harder for me? If you're one year away from retirement, going and putting all your money into a you know high risk share portfolio is probably not the right thing to do. But if you're in your 20s or 30s and you've got you know 20 or 30 years of working life and you've got time to ride the ups and downs of the market, you can probably afford to take on that little bit more risk. So that's a really key thing when it comes to investing is what risk can I take on? You know, what's the time frame I've got? What are the returns I'm looking to achieve here? But always take that step back and have that, that long-term approach. Um, I'll just get you to go to the next slide for me, Joe. Perfect. And this is... Um, we love this chart, the NCAR chart. This is uh, over the last 30 odd years. Um, you can see again too that that general trend will always be up on, on um, 
growth assets and investments, you can see US shares outperforming Australian shares there. So generally, US shares will have a higher growth uh, orientation. So with any asset, we make money in two ways, either from the growth of that asset or from the income it provides. So a property, the growth is the value of the property going up. The income is the rent that you get if you're getting rental payments. Shares, the growth is the value of the share going up and the income of the dividends that you're paid. US shares aren't the best dividend paying shares, um, but they're generally more orientated towards growth. So if you look at all the big companies, you know, Meta, Apple, um, you know, a a Alphabet or Google, they pay terrible dividends, but they have higher growth. Whereas Australia is a bit opposite. Australia, we do have growth with our share market, but Australia is a phenomenal market for dividends. We have franking credits, we have all the mining companies, the banking companies, they pay really high dividends. So again, when we're investing, we've got to ask, what's the purpose of this investment? You know, am I 25 and I just want my money to grow as quick as possible? Okay, well, maybe I'll have more of a US orientation or an international orientation in my portfolio. Or, you know, am I 65 and I want some income to provide me throughout my retirement? Okay, well, maybe I'll change that portfolio over to provide me more of that, uh, you know, dividend and income base as well too. Perfect. So when it comes to investing, though, there are, again, and I'm going to let Terry touch on a few of these because there's a lot you need to know. Um, there's a few, again, key complexities when we move from Australia to the US and things you need to think about. So we touched on a little bit already, um, CGT, you know, with property, but there are also CGT rules when it comes to shares. So you've got deemed disposal when you leave Australia, acquisition rules when you come back to Australia. Again, you've got investment structures that can be considered. So superannuation is a structure, you've got trusts, investment companies, these can all be taxed differently, but sometimes can be much worse off uh, than, than where, where you are if you're just in your personal name. So again, you need to consider that. And the biggest one, which we'll cover off a fair bit today, or well, the one that I see most common, uh, PFIX, um, so passive foreign investment companies. To, to sum that up nicely, the IRS is not your friend and they will tax you if they can tax you. Uh, that's the way I like to think about PFIX. But Terry, did you want to explain these from a tax point of view, you know, in a little bit more detail? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Will. Um, and, you know, like, as I think was sort of exemplified when um, when Jared was answering Trish's question, like it does get quite complicated when you're trying to work out like what's going to be the tax impact of a particular investment type because it is very specific to your circumstances. Um it does create complexities, but it also creates opportunities. And there is actually um, opportunities to potentially, you know, pay less tax than you would have otherwise paid had you just been staying in Australia. Mm -hmm. um, the the first one that we we see that, that people should be aware of, um, you know, and this is sort of applicable anytime you're you're leaving Australia to go and work overseas and breaking Australian tax residency. So it's not, you know, it's not a US specific issue, um, but it's the the deemed disposal rules. So Basically, Australia has these rules that say um, when you leave Australia and break Australian tax residency, you're deemed to have sold all of your assets for whatever they're worth on that day. Um, now, that's sort of the starting point. There are exemptions. So um, the biggest exemption is Australian real estate. So, you know, any property in Australia, that's completely outside of these rules. Um, but it does apply to share portfolios. And that's that's the big one that um, we see in practice. You do have a choice though, and your choice is basically you can either um, you know, pay that tax, which is effectively an exit tax from Australia on any unrealized gains when you break Australian tax residency, or you can choose to basically elect out of that tax treatment. And then by electing out of that tax treatment, the implication is that later on down the track, when you eventually sell those assets, that's when you're going to pay the Australian capital gains tax. Mm. And there are sort of pros and cons to both approaches. Um, and, you know, there's often sort of a, a bit of optimization and calculations that we can do to sort of figure out for a client, you know, should you take the deemed disposal or should you elect out? Um, the biggest benefit of taking the deemed disposal is there are rules that work the reciprocal on the way back in called the mm. deemed acquisition. And those rules basically say, if you have acquired an asset as a non-resident, or if you've previously deemed disposed of an asset, when you eventually come back to Australia, you get an uplift. And your starting point for Australian capital gains tax is then, what's that asset worth the day you come back to Australia? So some clients will sort of employ a strategy where, 
they'll buy growth assets knowing that you know they're going to eventually come back to Australia and they'll hold on to those assets. Um, those assets will appreciate in value and then they come back to Australia, they break US tax residency um, and then you know they sell those assets shortly afterwards and they effectively haven't don't have to pay tax on any of that growth in the meantime. Um, and that can be a, you know, a much better outcome than if they had just stayed in Australia where they would have been taxed on the entire amount. So, you know, thinking about the deemed disposal rules and, and how you can then structure your investments and what sort of investments to buy. If, if you know that, you know, you're going to be in the US for a certain time period and then coming back to Australia can be really beneficial. Mm. Um, use of investment structures. So th this does get you know, re really complicated and we've got some some diagrams later that um, uh, sort of help exemplify this. But, um, you know, there's there's a lot of opportunities, you know, when you're living in Australia to use investment structures to optimize your tax position. So family trusts, you, you know, superannuation, uh, SMSFs, sometimes, you know, um, charitable uh, foundations, things like that. They're all great and they're, they're, they're optimized for people, though, who are living in Australia. When you break Australian tax residency, when you go to the US, you know, the planning's out the window. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I've seen too many times situations where clients have done all this great tax planning with all these intricate structures in Australia, and they've really optimized down for the last dollar of tax. And then they go to the US and they end up getting smashed um, and paying, you know, much more um, in, you know, US or Australian taxes than they otherwise would have paid. And, you know, increasing the complexity of their affairs and, and on the back of that, you know, increasing their compliance costs because the U.S. is, um, is very extreme with um, reporting of any um, Australian investment structures. So, for example, if you've got a, a, an Australian trust, they want to know everything and you have to do all these additional forms and disclose everything and it's really, really complicated and it's really, really expensive. Um, so, you know, you're, you're increasing your, your U.S. tax compliance costs as well um, mm. by having those structures. So, you know, sometimes I tell clients to actually just, you know, shut down the structure before you go um, because it's, it's just not going to work. But again, getting that advice before you go to the U.S. and before you trigger all this stuff is, is really important and can, and can save a lot of tax. Um, and then the other big one, which, which we'll touch upon, is, is the PFIC. Um, so maybe if we just go to the next slide, because there's, there's a little bit more detail there. Um, so this is this is kind of the the nasty four four letter word when it comes to to US tax. Um, mm -hmm. So so PFIC stands for Passive Foreign Investment Company, and basically the US has these rules uh, and they're sort of anti deferral rules. And what they're trying to prevent is a situation where, as a US taxpayer, you you just go and set up a foreign company. You put all your money in a foreign company and invest just in assets in that foreign company. And then it just keeps going up in value within the company and you never pay a dividend and you never pay US tax and you get you get deferral essentially. And so the rules are set up to prevent that outcome. But the rules are so broad that they pull in a lot of, um, you know, usual type of investment structures for Australians. Mm -hmm. So basically pretty much any ASX listed ETF, um, yeah, LICs, um, managed funds in Australia, any sort of um, passive or pooled type investment vehicle that is based outside of the US is going to fall into these rules. Mm -hmm. And um, what that basically means, again, it do, the rules that do get very complicated and there's certain elections you can make, but um, basically it's going to give you a worse tax outcome in the US and it's going to significantly increase the complexity and the costs of your US tax returns. Mm -hmm. So avoiding these type of investments um, and ideally avoiding them before you go to the US can be can save you a lot of money. Um, and that's why, you know, you need to be speaking to financial advisors like Jared and Will who, who understand the cross border stuff and understand um, that if you go to the US, you're going to be in this situation because, um, you know, a, a lot of we find a lot of domestic financial advisors, they just don't have that sort of knowledge. And they're just going to put you into a whole bunch of, you know, ETFs or Australian managed funds, which is, you know, somewhat typical. 
uh, and it's just going to cause a lot of headaches when you're in the US. Um, yeah. So, you know, getting that advice and, and speaking to the right people before you go um, is really important to avoid this, uh, the PFIC uh, implications. Yeah. And correct me if I'm wrong, Terry, but at the moment, is it, it's the federal, it's like 38%, 39% or something, the penalty with PFIC um, that they, the IRS can impose. But one way that we get, I suppose, to give people a little bit more detail and options that you've got when it comes to investing, because again, we don't want to scare you away from investing. We want to make sure that you are investing and growing your wealth. But something we can commonly look at is using potentially US domiciled um, ETFs. That, that's a strategy that usually can eliminate this risk or reduce this risk a lot more. Um, and you can actually invest on the ASX, so still in the Australian share market, so you know within your superannuation or within you know your funds you've got here in Australia, you can still invest in US domiciled ETFs on the ASX. So there are ways to get around this, or there are ways to reduce your risks, I should say. Um, but yeah, as Terry touched on, the penalties can be quite high um, and sometimes erode a lot of your performance and a lot of your hard work when it comes to investing. So the more that we can reduce these penalties, reduce these risks, the better. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so I think the yeah the other sort of main uh, main thing that we see for a lot of clients recently going to the US because we do a lot of work with um with you know early stage companies um you know often with founders or early employees who have a lot of equity in their companies um you know the the US rules around employee equity and founder equity um, can be quite different to Australia. And, um, you, you know, again, similar to the concept about, you know, the, the property for a lot of these clients, you know, equity in their, in their employer or in their company is, is their largest asset or their largest potential asset as it grows. And so, again, like making sure you get that advice up front can be really important. You know, sometimes it's as simple as just exercising some stock options before you go. Um, you know, it can be that simple. And also, you know, thinking about, you know, does it make sense to actually have that equity, you know, in in a trust structure, in a superannuation structure when you're going to the US, or should you just pull it out and hold it directly? So um, it's those sort of conversations that we'd be having with clients in that situation. Mm -hmm. um, and then, I mean, we don't have to, you know, spend too much time on, on this slide, but this is just sort of uh, to exemplify some of the issues that come up around Australian family trusts when you go to the US. Again, because the US basically looks through a lot of these structures, you know, it, it can be um, not as effective to use an Australian trust um, to invest. There's also issues on the Australian side with the trust and whether the trust is still an Australian tax resident because, you know, the trust itself is a, you know, is a different taxpayer to you as the individual and thinking about the trust's tax residency is equally important. Um, so again, main message is, you know, if you've got a trust, just get the advice up front. Hmm. Perfect. I love the little diagram there. It explains it quite well, <laughs> Terry, <laughs> the, the different sides of things. Um, but yeah, guys, I'm just, just wary of time. Um, we want to make sure we leave some time for questions at the end. So what I'm going to do is the next topic we're going to cover off is superannuation. I'll go through superannuation a bit quicker. And obviously, if there's any questions at the end, we'll make sure we cover them off. So superannuation in Australia, obviously, it's it's a lot of it's something a lot of people don't think about until they're you know ready to access the money. But generally, there's the two phases, accumulation phase where you can grow your wealth, and then drawdown phase once you meet a condition of release and the money becomes accessible. For most people, that's either turning age 60 and retiring or turning age 65, regardless of what you're doing with work. Um, so there's lots and lots of different types of funds that we can have with superannuation. You've got retail funds, um, self-managed super funds, industry funds. Jad, have you just got the next slide for me? Um, defined benefit schemes. Generally, when you're in the US, avoid self-managed super funds. <laughs> what is that? As Terry just trust, uh, touched on, um, you know, the trust structures maintain themselves in Australia can be quite complex. That's effectively how a self-managed super fund would work. It's it's a trust structure that you're controlling. Uh, while you're in the US, it can just it can be a massive, massive headache. And if it's a non-compliant fund, the Australian government can tax it at 47%. So most people we see in industry funds and retail funds, again, when it comes to industry funds, you've got to be careful of those PFIC uh, risks. Retail funds usually allow us more flexibility of what we can invest in um, so that we might have the opportunity to reduce these risks and have a bit more flexibility of what we choose. Um, but the big thing to note is obviously the cost. So if your balance is only twenty or $30,000, a retail fund might be quite expensive for that you know, amount, whereas an industry fund might be more cost effective. But if your balance is 
100K plus, retail funds then become quite cost competitive as well and sometimes much better. So again, just looking through your situation, your balance, your age, what you're doing is really, really important. But again, we just want to be reducing these risks um, wherever possible. Um, so on to the compliance side of things, as I said, FMSFs, they are need to maintain their central management and control in Australia. Um, so again, this can be a big issue if you've got an SMSF and you're living in the States. A way around it, what a lot of people will consider is getting a power of attorney, um, someone else maybe who's in the, the uh, self-managed super fund that can um, be managing that and maintain the control in Australia. But again, too, when it comes to our superannuation, it's for the sole purpose of your retirement. That's a legal law here in Australia where you need to make sure that you're not using your super for anything else other than your retirement. And so as long as you continue to maintain these um, these tests and you keep ticking these boxes, you wouldn't have any issues. But for a lot of people with self-managed super funds who are saying we want to move to the US, generally it can be a smart decision to you know wrap it up, simplify things. Not in all cases. Sometimes it can be better to keep it. Obviously, it depends on your situation. But again, you just want to make sure that what you're doing is aligned. Now, when it comes on to the different types of contributions we can make into super, there's primarily two. There's concessional which go in pre-tax, the current limit for those are $30,000. And there's non-concessional, which go in post-tax, current limit for those are $120,000. When you're in Australia, adding money into your superannuation is generally a great thing to do. It's a very tax-friendly environment, maximum tax of 15% at the moment. When you retire, it's tax-free. So you can be 60, you can have $1.5 million in your super or in a pension account, fully tax-free. So it's really, really tax-effective um, structure to invest in and to grow your wealth in. The downside is you can't touch that money until you're 60, so you do lock it away. When you're in the US, though, there's another at level of complexity for, I think, the fourth time I've said that to, in this webinar. The IRS potentially can tax contributions going into super. They can potentially tax the growth on your super. So you've got to be really, really careful on whether you're making contributions or not. Um, speaking with Terry can be something that is still tax beneficial. There can still be that arbitrage and that benefit. But a lot of the time too, it's you're paying more tax than you know if you just held it in your personal name or a company or whatever structure you've got. So again, everyone's situation is different depending on your income, you know, where you are, what you're trying to do when you're coming back. You really need to weigh up the options. Um, but Jared, I think the next few slides just go through um, the benefits of these contributions. And again, as I said, we don't want to scare people away from investing. You just need to make sure that you're considering the options. So concessional or oh, non-concessional contribution. Oh, yeah, I'll go through that, Jared. The concessional contributions, um, this is where we get the tax benefit from them if we can contribute to them. And this is just from the Australian side. So in this scenario, let's say you make $100,000 a year, you're in Australia, your employer will put in 11.5%. It's a super guarantee, so eleven and a half thousand dollars. So on the left, we don't do anything. You're left with net income of seventy-seven grand a year. Your super's gone up by eleven and a half grand because your employer put that in. Scenario on the right, though, we put ten thousand dollars into super as a concessional contribution. We actually get to claim that whole ten thousand dollars as a tax deduction here in Australia. So if you have rental income, if you sell a property and you've got capital gains, it can be a great way to reduce that tax bill. So in this scenario, um, the person saving seventeen hundred dollars in taxes by putting that 10 grand into super and claim it as a tax deduction. Again, if they've sold a property or something and they're, they've made a $300,000 you know, capital gain, their tax bill is much higher than the top marginal tax rate, those savings just get emphasized so much more as well too. But again, if you're doing this while you're a US tax resident, there's other considerations you need to think about. So that's the important thing. Um, just making sure that if we are going to contribute we're both aligning from the Australian side, what are the benefits there, but from the US side as well too. So non-concessionals, they go into super tax-free. They have a higher limit. They also go to your beneficiaries tax-free as well too. Um, really, as expats, if you didn't have any taxable income in Australia, you would be doing non-concessionals because otherwise you're paying 15% tax on concessional when you can pay zero. So if you are going to contribute, generally the non-concessionals are better. If you've got no taxable income in Australia, if you've got taxable income in Australia, it's the other way around because you get a tax deduction and you get to save some money there. Um, perfect. Um, so with the non-concessionals, there's a few different types. Uh, current limit, as I said, is 120. You can put in three years worth, though, at any one point in time. So you can put in $360,000 today, but no more for the next three financial years, the Australian financial years. You've also got the downsizer. So if you own your own home in Australia for more than 10 years, you're over age 55 and you sell it, you can put in $300,000 each into your super, completely tax-free. Does not impact any of the other caps. 
And then you've got the government contribution and the spouse contribution there if you make lower incomes. So under about 40 odd grand a year. Um, if the government, you put in $500, I'll match it. And the spouse contribution, you can put in $3,000 for your spouse and you will get a $540 tax offset. So that can be really beneficial if potentially, you know, one person's on a higher income, the spouse has taken maybe time off work to have kids or something like that. So therefore the spouse's income is below that threshold. It's a $540, not deduction, an offset. So $540 back in your pocket. Um, so again, just weighing up what options are best for you when we contribute to super can be really important because again, it can either grow your balance much higher or you know reduce your taxes along the way. Um, perfect, just go to the next one for me, Jared. Um, yes, so as I said, there can be more than one tax though when we consider this. So I might pass over to Terry again, the tax specialist. Terry, what are the main things we need to think about when we look at you know super contributions or investing in our super if we are a US tax resident and, and minimizing any you know penalties or taxes there? Yeah, so I, I think the the first thing um, to to realize it, and this is what a lot of um, the people, the clients we speak to, um, really, really struggle with, I guess, at the start, um, is the US is gonna is gonna tax your super, um, yeah. and that's uh, you know that's not fair. <laughs> uh, everyone knows that's not fair, but uh, unfortunately, that's the way it is. Um, the US uh, Australia tax treaty, unfortunately, it's quite old compared to some of the other treaties, and it was actually implemented uh, before there was mandatory superannuation. So trying to deal with um, you know exempting superannuation really wasn't considered. At the time the treaty was uh, negotiated, there's always uh, hope that uh, the treaty will be renegotiated at some stage. But at this stage, um, you know, we don't have any uh, any reason to think that's going to happen anytime soon. So the U.S. is going to tax your super. Um, the question is then, like, how is the U.S. going to tax your super? And that's where we do have to do a little bit of analysis. The main criteria we'd be looking at is um, where the source of the funds have come from. So for most people, um, you know, the main source of funds in their superannuation is from employment. So they've probably been working, you know, if they've been working in Australia all their life, their employers have um, paid into their super and they've built up a balance uh, by way of those employment contributions. Um, as clients, you know, uh, get wealthier or if they're self-employed and things like that, they may make personal superannuation contributions. Um, once the superannuation contributions in the fund exceed um, 50% for personal contributions, that's when the US tax treatment of that super flips. So for most super funds where it's just employment contributions and it's less than 50%, then it'll be considered a non-qualifying pension for US purposes. And essentially what that means is those contributions going into the fund will just be wage income for US purposes. And then for certain employees where they're considered highly compensated employees, and the threshold for highly compensated is about $155,000 of um, salary per year. Once you're over that amount, the growth in your superannuation fund is going to be subject to US tax as wage income. So effectively, what that means is we'd look at what's your super fund worth January 1, beginning of the US tax year in equivalent US dollars. What's your super fund worth December 31st, end of the US tax year in equivalent US dollars. And that difference, that just gets whacked onto your US tax return as income. Um, and But once you flip and once you have more than 50% of your fund being from personal contributions from the individual, it's no longer considered a pension. So that's when it flips to being considered what's called a grantor trust. And essentially a grantor trust is um, a trust that is looked through for US purposes. So at that point, we're basically pretending that the super fund itself as an entity doesn't exist and we're just looking at what are the underlying investments within that super fund and what income is being generated by those investments and um, you know sometimes that can give a better result from a u.s tax perspective because you're not necessarily paying taxes on unrealized gains um, where you would be if it's just a you know a non-qualifying pension but by flipping it into being a grant or trust you do have a lot of additional disclosures, again, on the US side and your US compliance costs go up. So just, you know, if you're sort of, you know, on, on the cusp, you, you really want to think about, does it make sense to 
um, you know, make those additional contributions and flip it or not in your circumstances. Um, and, you know, is that additional compliance cost worth, um, you know, the upside um, from the US tax perspective? So, yeah, it, it does get a bit complicated. Um, but, you know, key takeaway is the US is going to tax the super. It's just a question of how. Perfect. I think we'll skip on to the next one, Jared. I might cover off the 401ks and IRAs. So most people, um, you know, moving to the US, if they start working there, they'll generally have a company 401k. They might um, start contributing themselves to an IRA. Um, the big takeaways when we look at these, uh, they are very different to superannuation. So uh, as Terry touched on, the tax treaty between our countries was, I think, is the 80s. Superannuation became compulsory in the early 90s. So they don't see each other as, as aligned. Um, so superannuation in Australia, because you can actually get your 401k and IRA at any time, we don't see it as a compliant you know, retirement fund here in Australia. And then in, in the US, they see more superannuation. They have their social security. They don't see superannuation as, as a qualifying pension as well. So it's a bit of a misalignment. Hopefully it does align in the future. Um, but yeah, you just need to know the key things here that these are very, very different. So super is generally restricted to age 60. 401ks and IRAs, you can get out earlier, but there's going to be a 10% penalty for doing so. Generally, you're going to want to wait until you're 59 and a half years old. Um, but yeah, your 401ks, uh, usually, obviously, if you're working with a company, you're getting the contributions. IRAs, if you're putting money in yourself. The key things, too, with these um, retirement schemes are just to remember, you know, how are they invested? How are they growing? You know, what are they actually getting me to? Too many people think, oh, I'm 20 years away from retirement. I'm not going to think about, you know, what to do with these. If you get them invested correctly now and they're growing at a much faster rate and they're doing what they need to do, you're going to potentially be hundreds of thousands of dollars better off by retirement. So the more that you address these sooner, the better. Um, I'm actually going to keep moving on, Jared. I'll just, just aware of the time. Um, so what happens when you repatriate to Australia? Um, this is a question we get asked quite frequently. The big thing is to start asking questions. Every single person's situation is vastly different. And therefore, what happens when you repatriate is going to be vastly different. You know, so, you know, what happens to my insurances? Am I selling any assets in the US, like a home or any shares? What's happening in my visas? Am I going to be taxed in both countries? You know, do I still have tax liabilities in both countries? What am I doing in my 401k or my retirement schemes? Um, you know, what are we doing? We're buying a property in Australia. So there's so many variables that you need to think about. So the key thing for when you're considering repatriation reach out, start asking questions. The more questions you ask, the more detailed of a scenario you'll have and the more you'll understand what options are available to you and what the challenges are going to be for you. Um, perfect, just moving forward. What happens when I retire? So obviously superannuation, you can access that age 60 as I touched on. Um, and then 401ks, IRAs, you can take them out at any point in time, but there can be penalties and taxes for doing so. After age 59 and a half, those uh, reduce, the 10% penalty reduces. Um, when you're in Australia, you can put your money into what's called an account-based pension. So Jared, just go to the next slide for me. Account, uh, one more, sorry. The account-based pensions uh, after age 60 in Australia are fully tax-free, okay? Or up until a certain limit. So currently the maximum you can have in them is $1.9 million. So the example on the screen here, if you had a $1.9 million investment property and it paid you $95,000 a year rent, you'd be paying $23,000 a year in taxes every single year. If you sold the property too, then you've got capital gains tax. If you have other income, that tax bill is going to be higher. However, if you're over age 60, you've got your money in an account-based pension, which is just a superannuation environment. You move it into a pension account, what most people will do, that $1.9 million is fully tax-free. So you pull out 95 grand a year to, to live off as your pension payment, you keep every cent. You want to pull out $300,000 as a lump sum, you know, to give to the kids as a present. No tax implications here in Australia. If your $1.9 million has a good year, it makes a 10% return, so $190,000, you'll keep every set. So there's not very many things in Australia or the US for that matter, you know, where you can make 200 grand and the IRS or the APO doesn't get some of it. So again, it just shows you the importance of making sure that you are growing these assets as much as you can. Yes, you will be paying tax on them throughout their life, but the, the healthier that you can get them towards your retirement, generally the better, because it means you're going to have you know, 20, 30, 40 years of retirement, whatever it's going to be, with a very healthy amount of funds in a very low tax or tax-free environment. So that's going to be the end goal. Um, obviously, not many people like to talk about this type of stuff, but we like to bring it in here because it is important. What happens when you die? So estate planning is really key. Generally, it's best practice to have, you know, your estate plan managed for Australian assets and for US 
assets as well too, okay? Um, you, you can sometimes be bringing legal documents from one country to another, like a will or power of attorney, but it can be an absolute nightmare to do. So generally, we always say it's best practice, you know, have a will in the country, you, you know, you reside in, your domicile to the US, for instance, have a will in Australia that deals with your Australian assets. When it comes to the tax side of things, um, Australia and the US, again, are very different in that sense. In Australia, we don't have an inheritance tax as such. You know, if, if, if I pass away and give my million dollars to Jared, there's not just a flat rate of inheritance tax. It doesn't work like that. In Australia, it depends on what the asset is. When did you buy it? What's the capital gain been? You know, superannuation, for instance, any non-concessionals go tax-free to your beneficiary. Any concessionals can be taxed up to 17% when you pass away. So again, every single asset here in Australia is very different. And in the US, there can be estate taxes, to put it very bluntly in that sense. Terry, did you want to touch on the tax side of things at all, you know, on the estate taxes in a little bit more detail? Or uh, Yeah, I mean, uh, just briefly, because it's a, it's a pretty uh, in-depth topic, uh, as you can imagine. And, um, you know, getting getting the tax advice on on on, on both jurisdictions is is also important like we do a lot of work with um you know u.s citizens and green card holders here in australia um mm. around their estate planning um because uh it can get really complicated especially when you're talking about testamentary trusts and things like that um but the, i think the main thing to think about is you know if, if you're going to the u.s the, in terms of estate taxes is if you do pass away holding u.s assets and this is irrespective of whether you're an Aussie living in the US or whether um, you know you're you're back in Australia. If you have any US assets, you have a potential exposure to US estate tax. So um, Microsoft shares, um, you know, um, the, the 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 condo in 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 the ski, ski fields in Colorado, um, you've got a potential exposure to a US estate tax, which could be up to forty percent. And so just understanding that and you know there's usually some pretty simple things you can do to mitigate that risk um, is probably the the key thing for for any Australians um, irrespective of whether you you know you're working in the US or you're back in Australia. Perfect. Um, so yeah with superannuation you do have lots of different options with your beneficiaries so it's a non-estate asset so you have to nominate um, someone that's a, a CISAC dependent effectively in Australia meaning a spouse a child or someone who's financially dependent on you. So again, this is somewhere where we see a lot of people slip up where they you know, nominate a sister or a parent or something like that as their beneficiary, that can actually be invalid. So meaning when you pass away, there can be a big issue of where that money goes. Uh, if you did want that money to go to someone who's not a dependent um, through the laws there, you can nominate your legal personal representative, which is your estate or your will. And then your will would state, I want my money to go to my sister or brother or someone like that. So again, just checking that your beneficiary is up to date and they're actually valid uh, is another key thing. Now, moving on to the opportunities, there are a few opportunities we are seeing at the moment. So as we touched on already, the weak Australian dollar, um, you know, if you are living and working in the US, you're making US income, um, sending some money back to Australia for investments, for super, for property, whatever it's going to be. Um, because of the weak Australian dollar right now, you can be getting a little bit more bang for buck. Obviously, no one has a crystal ball. No one knows what's going to happen in the future, but most economists are predicting that the Australian dollar will continue to get stronger as time goes on for the next six to 12 months. Um, so based on that, it can be a good time now to start moving things back. Again, the other opportunities you want to be looking at, obviously, the more that you sacrifice now, the better you're going to be in the future. The more that you can invest now, put away now, save now, um, the more you'll grow your wealth and the more you'll then get to enjoy yourself later in life. So using your superannuation, making sure it's invested correctly, any tax deductible contributions, if relevant. Um, obviously, as, as Terry touched on, you know, making sure we reduce any P figures. So we're reducing taxes in the US as well, too. Moving to what was it, Terry? Nevada, Florida, <laughs> maybe one of those states with no state tax income. That can always be beneficial too. Um, but yeah, the key thing is, and I think the key takeaway from today is everyone's situation is so vastly different. So the more that you start to ask questions about well, what do I want to do and what are my assets and how long am I here and what's my time frame? And the more questions you can start to answer about your situation, the clearer you'll have your strategy lined out in front of you. Because you'll say, okay, well, I can't get a property right now, but I could go down the share path, or I could put more money into my IRA or into my super or into an investment. So again, the key thing is just to start asking questions. And the sooner we do that, the better. Uh, and I think on that note, Jared, are there any questions we wanted to cover off? We do have a few questions. Yeah. So look, um, first and foremost, thank you for everyone's time.
Uh, but we'll dive straight into the questions. I'm mindful we're a few minutes uh, over, but uh, hopefully that's been tremendously valuable. As you can see, a lot to cover when we dive into these topics. Um, so let's just touch on the first one first. Uh, and Terry, I'll throw this one to you. So Julian asking, does the deemed disposal rule apply to shares inside a self-managed super fund? Uh, yeah, so the answer to that is um, no, unless something's gone wrong. <laughs> so <laughs> we, we really don't want a self-managed super fund to be breaking Australian tax residency because um, that's going to cause big big problems for the fund. Um, mm -hmm. And that's why I think, as, as Jared, you mentioned, you're going through that process of um, you're appointing somebody to be managing the fund on your behalf when you're overseas is, is important from an Australian compliance perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so generally superannuation will maintain itself as an Australian tax resident. Even if you're living anywhere else in the world, the superannuation stays in Australia. Excellent. All right, next question. So changing tact a little bit here. Uh, what about creating a will? So, Will, you touched on the topic of wills, uh, where your assets are. So Lisa's asking, if a US resident, so currently residing in the US, should that will just be set up in the United States? It depends on what assets that you've got. So the big thing, we will always say have a will for your Australian assets and a will for your US assets is the easiest way to do it. Costs a little bit more money because you've got to see a solicitor in Australia and a solicitor in the US. But obviously, if someone passes away, it's just so much more easy. You know, you can say that the US uh, will deals with the condo in Colorado, to use Terry's example, you know, the Microsoft shares, everything that you've got in the US. The will in Australia deals with, you know, the family home, the investments in Australia. The key thing is to note that some assets are non-estate assets, like superannuation. So they don't go through a will or through your estate unless you elect them to. You know, insurance benefits, so like life insurance is a non-estate asset. It doesn't usually go through a will unless you elect it to. Um, so it's just key to note that some things don't go through your will. So you need to say, right, well, what assets do I have? Where are they? And then therefore, what should I, you know, put in my will based on those things. Um, again, too, once you get in the more complexities of it, you can have trust inside of wills as well if you've got special terms for, you know, your beneficiaries. So usually sitting down with a solicitor, you know, in the US is a good decision just to say, right, what, you know, what should I do with my assets here and what do we think? And doing the same in Australia as well too. Um, the same too, that's will, also powers of attorney. Um, you know, just making sure if anything goes wrong, you're completely covered with that estate plan. But yeah, generally best practice to have one in each country. Excellent. And of course, if you move or you get married or divorced or have children, just review these documents, particularly the more you, the more of them that you have, uh, the more complicated that can be. Um, and one of those little nuisance factors of wills in general is a marriage will automatically revoke a will, whereas a divorce will not. Who came up with that one? But there you go. Uh, a good reminder to make sure that they are up to date and reflect current wishes at the time. All right. So next question, and Terry, I'll throw this one to you. So uh, Roy's asking, uh, I've got a, a, a share trading account with Combank, tax resident of the United States. We're going to invest in some shares or ETFs. What would be the tax implications? Now, you've touched on this a little bit around domicile, you know, what those assets actually are. But I guess, you know, broadly, are there other taxes that Roy would need to worry about other than just if he sells those assets? Um, so, it, again, it's really just going to depend upon what the investments are. So shares, like if it's just, you know, active businesses in Australia, that's probably not too much of an issue. ETFs is going to be an issue because ETFs will probably fall into the PFIC rules. And then in terms of the implications, um, you know, uh, if they are PFIX and you are receiving any dividends from them, then that would trigger the additional reporting and the additional taxes on those mm -hmm. dividends. Um, so it's not necessarily just an issue for, for when you sell. Um, it, it can be an issue along the way if you're getting those dividends. I think a big thing to call out there too is if you're investing in Australian base platforms overseas, you need to be really careful on what platform you're using too. Um, you know, not shitting on Comsec by any means, but I've had clients overseas where Comsec have effectively said to them, you need to leave because you're no longer an Australian tax resident anymore. So if you are going to start an investing journey and you're doing that for five, 10 years, finding a platform that is expat friendly or global friendly as well can be really beneficial and just simplify things. Because if you get this nasty letter saying, hey, we need you to leave our, our, our services, Sometimes that means you need to sell the assets, meaning you, you'll incur 
the tax bills uh, and not from your choice from them thrusting that upon you. So again, just making sure you're using platforms that are a bit more expat friendly sometimes can be really beneficial as well. And I think just one one sort of final call out there, Roy, uh, just one thing to bear in mind, and we'll touch on this earlier, the actual domicile of the ETFs. So US domicile, generally good. Foreign domicile, generally bad. Again, seek personal advice there. But just be mindful that those funds can also change domicile over time as well. We had this issue a number of years ago where BlackRock adjusted the domicile of a number of their funds, and it meant that just about their entire suite of ETFs were no longer appropriate for US residents. So whilst we all like to think that ETFs are this great set and forget strategy, that can come back to bite you. Um, so just want to be very mindful of. Well, guys, we are at the end of questions and we are 11 minutes over, so we might wrap it up there. But uh, first and foremost, huge thank you to everyone who's joined the session. I uh, hope you've got a lot of value out of today. We, we've covered a lot. Um, as I said, this will be going up on YouTube, so you'll get a copy of the recording. Uh, you'll get Will and Terry's contact details. So if you have questions, reach out, book in a call with the guys. Uh, you can see they're a wealth of knowledge. Uh, but And of course, thank you to Terry and Will. Uh, it's been a tremendous session and uh, wishing everyone a fantastic evening, day and uh, rest of the week ahead. Awesome. Thanks so much, everyone. Thanks a lot, everyone. Bye.